City Hall, as well as Organization of Security and Cooperation of Europe. And finally, he's also worked for United Nations Development Program. So as you can see, he has a very rich experience and background. So we are so excited to interview him today. And top, on top of everything that's been said already, he also has a very interesting hobby. He is a pilot. So why don't we go ahead and meet him and we'll get to know him in person. Six and a half hours later. Okay, so our guest speaker is that Vikr Stambeke is finally here. So how was your flight? It was great. Yeah? Quick 25 minute flight. Mm -hmm. okay. I actually landed before you guys got here. So it was very good. Uh huh. So where did you come from? From Rhode Island. Rhode Island. From yeah. Rhode Island in 25 minutes. You should consider getting your pilot's license too. <laughs> This should have and been it's my also job. a beautiful view as you come down to the city, you see the city, it was beautiful. Nice. Yeah. All right, we're gonna go inside now and get to know more about how to get our pilot's license as well. Restrooms and facilities for pilots that is present in all airports. All right, so uh, we are at the executive terminal now. This is where pilots kind of hang out before the flight, so I'm gonna show you around. So, this is one of the rooms. You can get a snack from the vending machine, you can make yourself some coffee, and you know, you can just sit down and hang out. Let's go see some of the other rooms. Another room right here. It's darker here, so it's more relaxing. There's also a TV right there that you can just hang out and watch. Turn on the light, TV right there. Very nice. Okay, now we're gonna go to our conference room where the rest of the interview is gonna be recorded. Oh, it's a, like a boardroom. Every small airport has rooms like this. It's actually, as I told you guys, America has so many of these airports, so it's a very nice facility. And even if you come late and it's closed, there's still like a code, they give you a code, you can enter and you nice. can use any facility. Sometimes they have a kitchen. We wow. can, you know, prepare so there's something. no security sometimes you just go in like so well it's place. for pilots it's always open so yeah. let's say you came in the middle of the night you made an emergency landing let's say I see. you should be able to get in so there is a right. code that they give you and normally they'll tell you the code is something that every pilot knows mm -hmm. maybe like an emergency code you put that in you will enter and then you can rest here there's a place where you can rest mm -hmm. or you know you can do things so. nice yeah awesome. great wow I'm gonna open it. <laughs> so, we got some small gifts today. Hi, everyone. 
everyone. Today is a very exciting day for us as we are hosting our second ever in-person interview. And our guest today is Irza Pekirustan Bekev. So we are okay. very excited to have so, him today. As you can see, he has a very, very uh, rich background. So there's going to be a lot to talk about today. As that was not enough, he also has a very interesting hobby. And I don't know if you could guess, but he is also a pilot. So we will be discussing about his um, degrees, about his educational background, about his career, as well as his hobby today. So now Hi, we're going to let um, Dr. Rustam Bekov uh, introduce himself. Uh, I was born and raised in Tashkent. Um, I grew up in Oktapa in mm -hmm. Tashkent. And I went to Tashkent State Technical University where I studied business administration uh, with concentration in finance. Mm -hmm. And in 1999, I won um, Umid Scholarship. There was this Umid Foundation that would send uh, students overseas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I won that scholarship and came to America back in 99, studied in New York, got mm -hmm. my MBA in finance. Uh, at that time, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Frankly, I was 21 years old when, mm -hmm. I, when I came for master's degree. Yeah. I didn't even frankly know what MBA was. Um, and got my education, but then I had to go back to Uzbekistan. Uh, and UMIT was a great program, actually. Yeah. I would forever be grateful to Uzbekistan for that program because it gave a lot of opportunities to many of my mm -hmm. friends. Went back to Uzbekistan, and that's how I ended up working for Tashkent City Hall um, in, in the main finance division, Gorfu, Gradskoy Finu Pravlenia. And um, after three years working there, I won another scholarship. Wow. Went to uh, Scotland, University of St. Andrews. Studied there for a year and a half. Got my second master's degree. Mm -hmm. um, went back to Uzbekistan to finish my uh, study, uh, my, my work. Actually, in St. Andrews, I started a PhD. Okay. But Umid Foundation wanted me to come back and like finish working, which was fine. Mm -hmm. I went back. I had a couple more years remaining, so I finished working. I taught at Westminster University at that time, became an academic and worked, combined that with a um, job for United Nations Development Program, yeah. UNDP. Um, and then I knew I wanted to do a PhD. Mm. Um, didn't even know I would be a professor necessarily, yeah. but whether you're going in UN, like in many organizations, they want you to have a doctorate degree. But I didn't want to go to Scotland. After yeah. life in America, when I was in Scotland, even though it's a it's a it's a beautiful country, I just didn't feel at home. Yeah, it was too climate mainly. Yeah, in winter it's just so gloomy. You see sunlight for maybe five hours a day. Like mm -hmm. ten in the morning, it's still dark, and at four it gets dark. It's so depressing. And I from see. for me from Uzbekistan, we see so much sun. It's mm -hmm. just miserable. And I thought, oh my God, would I go there to do my doctorate and live like? few years since in the cold yeah. windy scotland so i applied to other schools mm -hmm. and that's how i ended up back in america and i was very excited came to america got my phd at odu old dominion mm -hmm. university that's norfolk virginia a, a beautiful place um, really loved the state of virginia and then once i finished um, i got my first academic job and uh, joined bryant university and okay. got an appointment as a faculty member uh, where I've been now already for eight years, got my tenure a few years ago, so I have a lifelong contract now. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's my story in brief. Okay. So how did you um, become interested in academia? Is that something you've always wanted to do or did, did just well, your life somehow it's, led you there? No, never thought I would be an academic. If somebody told me you will be a professor, I, never, I would have laughed at it. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was when I came back from United States, two years in New York, coming back, started working in, uh, in Tashkent City Hall. A few, few months later, a friend of mine had an American friend who came and we got together and I had a hard time speaking English. Wow. It freaked me out. Three months I didn't use my English and I started losing <laughs> it. And my other friend said, oh, you know, you know, we have another friend. He yeah. started in London. He haven't used his English for a year, he lost it. Like, if you don't use your English, you're gonna lose it. And another friend of mine said, the best way to upkeep is to teach somewhere in English. Mm -hmm. And I joined, there was a school, I don't know if it's still around, Kela uh, it was in Tashkent Economic University. Okay. And I started teaching there, you know, as an adjunct, like Saturdays, couple hours in English. So I thought if I, every week, I use my English for two hours, mm -hmm. it will stay in shape. Mm -hmm. And then, um, 
two hours became four hours. Wow. And my dean really liked the way I taught. I got okay. really good reviews from, from students and uh, she said, you need to do this. Actually, it was one day she called me in her office and she said, sit down. I'm like, what did I do wrong, you know? <laughs> And she's like, you know, we did the evaluations of all the faculty. Yep. She's like, and you got the highest. Wow. This is your gift in life. If you if you ever like um, if you ever stop teaching, God will not forgive you. She told me that. She's like, I'm wow. telling you this to you, like you don't understand it, but you have to do it yeah. because that's your gift in life. You should like not do other things. And I said, no, I wanna. I'm in finance, you know. Yeah. I wanna be like a maybe minister or something. Do some yeah. other things. But I kept it, it was, so at that time it was just like a kind of a hobby, something yeah. I like doing, something would bring me back to, I would have to read books mm -hmm. to do that, so yeah. that was the part of it. Um, but later in life, when I became a professor mm -hmm. at Bryant, when I, when I was doing my PhD, I observed the life of professors in America. Yeah. I fell in love with that life. Really? Lots of freedom. Um, it's like I my schedule is I usually work Tuesday Thursday two days a week nice only Very like flexible, three yeah. four hours I go I teach and then the rest of the time I do my research I do other things mm -hmm. uh, as a professor you have to do a few things it's not just teaching you have to do research publish papers also uh, you have to do service right. it's a very interesting thing in America all faculty expected to do service so as a volunteering okay. maybe teaching underprivileged kids. Is there specific hours you have to meet? No, it's not hours, okay. but you have to like show that you're doing something for, for the university, right. for your profession or for your community. That's a good initiative. You know, so one of those things, and as an academic, because it's an appointment, you have to show that you do that. Mm -hmm. Basically, you cannot be just focused on only like your own job. Right. You have to do something good for people around mm -hmm. you. So, and then if, you know, you do it for six years and they review your uh, performance, um, your publications, right. your teaching evaluations, because I teach in a private school, quality of teaching has to be good. Right. So there's a big emphasis on not just teaching, but you have to teach well. I see. So constantly trainings on how to deliver information in the mm -hmm. best way, things like that. And then on top of that, so, um, student evaluations, research papers, and your service. Those three things, they look at them, and then you can get tenured. So I got my tenure, which means I'm staying in Rhode Island. Okay. Uh, and yeah, that's my story. Now that you've talked about the requirements and just you know what's expected of you as a teacher, for those of us who want to go into academia, let's say become professors at a university, could you kind of talk about the steps um, necessary to become a professor in terms of degrees, in terms of any exams do you have to take? Is it tough? Is it easy? What do you have to say? Uh, what it's advice? a long way, guys. Is it? I, I re like. It's a, it's a great job, as I said, but right. you have to really be prepared. It, it's, a re, it's like a marathon. It's a very yeah. long haul. So depends on what field you're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm a professor of business, yep. which means that I had to have my MBA first. Yeah. They're also going to look at your academic credentials, like your GPA. Yeah. So you want to have a good GPA. Quick disclaimer, I was never a guy who would study for a long time. Yeah. I would just study the night before, right. but I got high grades. So that helped me. Uh, the GPA, the, the grades that you get are gonna be considered. Really important. Okay. Then your GMAT or GRE. Oh, so okay. business schools require GMAT, so it's like it's like other standardized tests. Mm -hmm. You have to score well on those. Um, for me, verbal part was a little bit more challenging. Yeah. I think it's true for all uh, immigrants, yeah. but in mathematical part, I got 100%. No. So that's how you have to show, so you have to balance it. And then I think you have like two essays or four essays. I, it, it's been a while. Right. Um, so you, you prepare those things, strong recommendation letters, academic credentials, your transcripts, mm -hmm. standardized tests, yeah. and you apply to different universities. Mm -hmm. And I was not in a position to pay for my education, so right. I needed to win a scholarship. That was another consideration. But then there are some schools that give you. So I got a full scholarship from uh, Old Dominion University. Nice. I was receiving money for good. going to school, which was good. Um, yeah, so, and then once you're in the program, mm -hmm. I would advise there are some books that you need to read because PhD programs in America are very competitive. Right. Only maybe out of 10 students, maybe two or three make it through. Wow. They, they weed out people wow. left and right. So you have to navigate through this environment mm -hmm. which can be political at times mm -hmm. so there are some books that help you do that 
Uh, obviously, have to be very hardworking, under promise, over deliver, mm -hmm. do research, study hard, so all those things. Yeah. In a PhD program, you cannot fail any class. If you fail, it's automatically they're wow. gonna disqualify you. You have to have high GPA, right. like high grades. Professors that you work with have to be happy with your performance because any one of them can potentially. Um, you know, every year they review whether they're going to give you funding for next year oh, because you cost okay. them money. Yeah. So they rank students. And if for whatever reason, you know, some professor thinks you're not hardworking, mm -hmm. that's it. They're just going to say, okay, we don't have wow. funding for you. So wow. things like that. But mainly um, it's an aptitude and just, just work hard. That's mm -hmm. it. And wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sounds like obtaining your PhD it was a lot of work. So congratulations <laughs> on having done that so now that if you know let's say a person has met all of those requirements now they are ready to join the academia is it challenging to get accepted to university to teach you know it's challenging for students to get accepted how is it for professors to find jobs well it depends on the universities a lot of universities and um, as I, when I was on the market I obviously traveled visited different schools mm -hmm. and I knew I wanted to be at, at private university all right so in a public university, there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. In a public university, normally class size is really big. Maybe you're teaching to 200 students or 100 or 400, depends mm -hmm. on the university. You normally don't have a connection with students. You are expected just to lecture and then you have research assistants who take care of, or teaching assistants who take care of grading mm -hmm. and things like that. In private universities, it's more one-on-one. -on -one, so I never have class sizes more than 30 students. Okay. I get to know my students really well. So it's it's kind of a different, a little bit different job. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I when I went to my university, I just fell in love. It just looked so beautiful, you know. Mm -hmm. Student levels are also different. Yeah. Uh, where university located is going to be a big factor. Right. So all those things play a role. Like I didn't want to be in a, somewhere in the middle of like some in the middle of America, like some not cosmopolitan place. I see. Because um, for me, it was important that there is different restaurants, mm -hmm. big cities not far, and uh, so Rhode Island was a great location. Mm -hmm. You know, Boston is down the road, New York is three hours driving, three and a half hours driving, yeah. or forty five Perfect hours location flying. for everything. <laughs> Yes, yeah. we'll get to that. So now that you sure. actually mentioned, why don't we talk about your hobbies and interests? Uh, we know one yeah. of them is a very challenging hobby to have, which, you know, you're a pilot. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how that idea came along? How did you decide to obtain your license and the process itself? There's no secret. I was raised in, you know, since I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. I think wow. many, many small boys have that dream. Right. And I used to go to Dvorets Pionierov and... Um, it was not far from Chorsu and there I went to um, club where we would make model planes or fly them. Wow. Okay. Yeah, like, I don't even know how to say it in, in English. Mm -hmm. So I went, I did that. I also did computers. I did a lot of things, but planes were always fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Things that they can do. Right. How, how they make the world small, you know, you can get on a plane in like eight hours. You can be in a different part yeah. of the world where people speak different languages. And just think about it like 100 years ago it will take you maybe eight weeks on the boat yeah and now it's just like six hours right. and, you, and you're like in Paris mm -hmm. so I always but with aviation it's kind of um, you need two things to have to be able to do that you need money and time yeah and in my life there were times when I didn't have money it was right. too expensive or I didn't have time there was mm -hmm. a time when I was making money but I could not go and fly because you need to prepare so when I submitted my tenure package, mm -hmm. my you know box like this with paperwork, I submitted it for a committee. I drive, I'm driving home, and I decided to stop by the airport just like this. Okay. I come to the airport. I walk in. I just came to to, to ask, and there was my my instructor who became later my instructor, an old man. At that time, he was 78. Now he's like 83. Wow. He still flies almost every day. Wow. He been, Is there no age limitations? Well, he has his health in good shape. Okay. So there's no age limitation. Uh -huh. So he passes his medical. So from 1961, he has been a pilot. Wow. That is I amazing. came there and I'm like, I look at all those pictures of planes and I'm like, and he's just like, and I said, I always dream to be a pilot. He's like, oh, okay. Let's go flying. I'm like, what do you mean go flying? Like, I just came to check. He's like, what are you gonna check? Grab that headset. Let's go and wow. just go up. 
<laughs> I'm like, we're gonna go. He's like, yeah, you're gonna fly the plane. Let's go. Oh, wow. Next thing I know, I'm in the plane. We're taking off. Obviously, he was flying, yes. but like, um, after we took off, he gave me the controls. He, I did a few maneuvers. Was that your first time in there? It was my very first time oh, as a pilot wow. in the cockpit. So he let you actually. Do yeah, yeah, he wow. liked me, and I, and I just came by to ask. Right. Next thing I know, we're over the city. We're, we're circling. Like he's like, okay, let's do left turn, right turn. Then we landed, and it's just like, and then we stopped. He's just like, okay, let's go. Like, uh, what do you think? I'm like, I like emotions were like, oh, right. like. But I didn't know I was a foreigner at that time. I didn't have my U.S. citizenship yet. And as a, if you're not a U.S. citizen, you cannot, you cannot get pilot. It's not so easy. You need to get oh, a clearance I from see. TSA. There's a okay. lot of paperwork. You have to give your fingerprints. Okay. It's full. It's full. Um, okay. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna airdrop it to here. Or should airdrop to your phone? Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, why don't we use this one? We haven't thought we tried it in that one. Maybe we just put it yeah, in the screen. Is it going to be all different angles now? Like the size, the same change? No, no, we're good. Okay. Uh, I mean, she wasn't speaking. So I'm looking at that camera, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the audience. Okay. Great. So, the, basically, if you want to become a pilot, just go visit an airport. Maybe, you know, somebody will take you up in the air and you can become a pilot, just like, you know, Dr. Stanbekev did. So now, um, could you talk about you know the requirements a little more in detail? Let's say I want to become a pilot. Where do I start? Where do I go? I was just telling you, right? When I landed and I was parking the yep. plane, there was a family came right. came by. It looked like a family. I, mm -hmm. I assume it was a family. And a girl your age, she was at the control. She started the plane. I think her father was next to her, and then your brother was on yep. the back, and mother was on the back. So she was actually she was manipulating the control okay so a lot of believe it or not in america a lot of children fly from age of 16 you can start flying and now summer you can wow. see so many kids flying uh, it's, really yes but you don't need a license isn't that illegal no as a student pilot you you know you do it with an instructor okay. and then once you qualify then you so there are a few stages okay. if you're a foreigner you need to get first tsa permission mm -hmm. once you get that permission that can take a couple of months maybe even three months but if you're a u.s citizen it's a fast it's, process it's, yeah you don't need that okay then um when you start flying you don't even need to have your medical certificate when you're starting okay so you can actually start flying see if you like it or not and okay. then at some point you'll have to go and get a medical certificate for pilot so as a pilot they're going to check your, your health yep. to make sure that um you know you can legally operate a plane your health allows you mm -hmm. once you have that you become officially a student pilot so that you get a license as a student pilot then maybe about depends on the person about 20 20 hours into it for me it was 16 i know one kid he actually did that 11 hours they sign you for solo which mm -hmm. means that from that point on you can fly by yourself okay and a lot of times then you need to build your confidence by flying by yourself so your instructor will tell you, okay, let's say when you have and he says, mm -hmm. okay, how about you fly to Martha's Vineyard, then you fly to Norwood, then you come back and you're wow. going to do it on your own. You're going to go fly, land, sign your logbook, go mm -hmm. to another place. That's actually the most exciting part. You know, you're going to be like, yeah. wow, like you're going to different places and right. it's just one flight, but you basically learn to navigate, do all these things. And you also build confidence to be in a plane by yourself because when your instructor is there, it's kind of easy. You always know there is a way out. Mm -hmm. If you were to, to get lost or something, there's somebody who will help you. When you're on your own, now you know there is no one. It's only you right. and your abilities. And it's a, it's actually a great feeling. Mm -hmm. oh, it's, it's addictive. <laughs> it's, it's addictive. Really? Once you do it, it's, it's yeah. It's, um, and then I would actually tell you guys, probably don't try to fly because that's like, that's like a drug addiction. Once really? you do it, you will just be, you will be spending all your time in the airport, all your money, <laughs> and, and the rest of your life is going to be around planes. Wow. That's how it happens normally, but it's, it's yeah. a great hobby. Wait, so you mentioned, you know, you just get an instructor basically and learn to fly, but before that, don't you have to have some basic knowledge? Do you have to go somewhere, like oh, take classes? So there, there's actually different ways to, to learn to fly. Mm -hmm. One is a very structured way. Okay. You like... Um, you go there's different types of schools like i think 61 or 41 i might be confusing the numbers so there are schools where you have to go and take classes but a lot of people who learn to fly are actually busy people yeah there's a lot of 
dentists, doctors, bankers, business yeah. people, lawyers, whatever, like they don't have time to go take classes. Mm -hmm. So you study, you have a book, you read the book, you okay. study, your instructor tells you read chapters three and four, mm -hmm. do this exercise, read this book. So you come for the next class, you're like, okay, have you read chapters three and four? Did mm -hmm. you understand how to do forward sleep? You discuss it. Wow. You're like, okay, yeah, now we're gonna go up and do it. Wow. And then you go, you do it. And then he's like, okay, now read the next chapter, you know, short field landing. Okay, have you read short field landing? What's the differences? Mm -hmm. And you discuss it, so that's how it goes. Mm -hmm. you know, you basically, you read the books, but if you just read the books and you don't do anything, again, that's knowledge gonna be lost. Right. So it's, it's actually a very interesting process. Uh -huh. You're flying, but you're also reading, you're doing exercises, you have to take a knowledge test, obviously. Yep. And then you take your pilot test, okay, which is a very hard test. To like take. you physically go with someone and they observe you flying. Yeah, it's called a pilot examiner. Um, first, they for about two or three hours they grill you. So you take a, a computer test. Yeah, you have to get at least seventy. But if mm -hmm. you guess close to seventy, you're gonna have a really hard practical test. Mm, wait, it's all in the same day? No, not oh, the same okay. day. So you go to a computer center, you take your um, computer test. Right then you set up the time for a practical test yeah. and that's when you come and then for a few hours they're going to talk to you they're going to mm -hmm. give you different situations you know they're going to see your aptitude yeah uh main emphasis in america is for safety okay and also going back to basics what i mean by that you should be able to fly the plane without gps you should be able oh. to fly the plane by using compass like right. things like that because there have been a lot of incidents where yeah. people get lost like you know you lose computer and yeah it kind of throws you off so you have to be very solid and actual flying i see um, and also your decision making they give you a lot of different situations like oh like you know you're flying with a friend your friend starts acting weird in the plane what do you do wow. you know your friend is like laughing hysterically or he's doing some weird stuff like right. your actions what are you going to do as a pilot wow and like you have to like tell them like you know how you're going to be doing it what are you going to be mm -hmm. doing it and things like that so once they think that you like mm -hmm. your, it's not just knowledge but like right. your aptitude is good decision-making process is good then you go up and you have to show all the maneuvers that mm -hmm. you can do um, some of them hard some of them easy mm -hmm. uh, we will do a couple of emergencies they're gonna shut down engine on you you already know as you're going so it's wow. it's a, and you have to and you have to land Wow, yeah. that sounds like an insane experience. But it's but it's fun. Once you get it done, it's it's so much fun. You're like, mm -hmm. wow, like I did it. Yeah. So. Okay, so if you're planning to get your license, make sure you're prepared for different emotional situations. <laughs> and let's say you you know now you have your license, you're good to fly. At what point can you fly other people? Well, once you get your license, you can fly. <laughs> so before <laughs> getting others. your license, you fly by yourself, and I flew by myself for maybe probably nine months I was okay. flying by myself which is also exciting I was going places meeting friends in other cities mm -hmm. lines. the only thing I could not do I could not take them on the plane I see that would be a violation okay. but I could go myself and I was I really had a lot of fun with that mm -hmm. and then at some point you know my instructor was like okay you need to take the test uh -huh. and you procrastinated because you're kind yeah. of flying but you and he's like no like you are in yeah. best shape right now just go and take the test yeah. and get it done so yeah so then you went oh okay that makes sense so now that you have your pilot's license what would you say what does it help you like what do you usually do how often do you fly do you go places is it really that easy to just you know it is it's very easy and we are very blessed america is actually an amazing country for pilots it's, yeah there was a time i think in the 90s where there was one million pilots in america wow so so many people flew and america has more airport than the whole world so really all airports together in the world there are fewer than in america but like currently as well yeah currently as well america wow, has a lot of airports that is a good fun fact yeah I never like knew that. I flew here, maybe less than half an hour flight. Right. I passed by five, six airports. Wow. If I go to New York, this is like uh, 45, maybe to 55 minutes. Mm -hmm. I passed maybe 10, 15 airports. There's airports everywhere. Right. So a lot of airports, a lot of infrastructure have been created. So America is a very flying country. Right. And also it has some of the best uh, freedoms in the sky. I think it's the only country in the world where you don't have to file a flight plan to fly. So what do, what do you mean by that? You can just come, get in your plane, mm -hmm. start it, and go. And if you don't want to talk to controllers, you don't have to. 
Uh, there aren't like specific roads or anything? Well, there are altitudes. You okay. go using specific altitudes. Okay. So, and the system is designed in such a way that it's, it's still very, very safe. Okay. But if you don't feel like, you can actually, you don't even have to talk to controls and ask permission. Wow. Yeah. So in that sense, it's, it's amazing. In most that countries, you have to like file a flight plan, right. get it approved, get it cleared, stuff like that. And you have yeah. to be... Obviously, if you're going to through New York mm -hmm. or like big cities, you then you have to be mm -hmm. talking to controllers again, depending on altitude. Even on New York, sometimes I fly at 8500, you can pass over New York City uh -huh. and you don't even you need to don't need to talk to anybody. That is amazing. Yeah. Wow. So I guess this is your your sign to go ahead and get your pilot's license because it sounds like a lot of fun. It's <laughs> I a lot might of actually fun. It is a lot it. of fun. And actually, there's a lot of overlaps with business. Like I uh -huh. teach business strategy. And I was always fascinated why so many CEOs have pilot licenses. Right. About 80% of CEOs have pilot licenses. Wow. So all of them know how to fly. Um, but as you study it, you realize that there is this thing called pilot personality. Mm -hmm. so there's certain people who gravitate to towards flying. I see. And actually the qualities they have are very closely matched with qualities of a successful business person. Wow. So ability so that makes sense. to you know, plan well, uh -huh. ability to understand risks, be comfortable in that environment. Yeah. Um, and then flying is very dynamic. So as you fly, the weather systems are dynamic, things change. Yeah. So you might have a plane, I'm going to the city, but then maybe there is like a thunderstorms around the city. So now you have to divert. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to Think adopt yeah. on the fly and change yeah. your plan and go to somewhere else. So things like that, are there's a lot of overlap in skill, right. skill sets and the ways of thinking, ways mm -hmm. of approaching. That's why for me, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Wow. It almost sounds like not only physically you have to be prepared, but emotionally to be able to handle different kinds of situations. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that is amazing. So now let's uh, talk a little bit more about your experiences abroad since, you know, we're Uzbek diaspora. We love talking about, you know, different countries. Yeah. So, you know, you, you were born and raised in Uzbekistan. Where did your journey abroad start and what countries have you been to, if any other than United First States? First country was uh, Malaysia for me. Wow, okay. I was exchange student um, in Malaysia in 19... I think I was a sophomore, so mm -hmm. like... And I went to Malaysia, I was an eye-opening experience. That was my first really long flight. And uh, KL Kuala Lumpur is, is like a very cool city, very mm -hmm. futuristic city. So I went there on exchange program with my friend from university, they sent yeah. us. And then second country was United States. Uh, I've traveled a around Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went, I've been to Moscow, like Georgia, other places, wow, okay. but it was like far away place was Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And I still have that, uh, you know, soft place in my heart to Malaysia. Now as a professor, I teach, uh, and some of my classes are classes experiential. Mm -hmm. So I take students to Malaysia and Singapore. Yeah. And I've taken my students there about six times mm -hmm. to that region. Uh, so it's a class which starts in America, then we go to Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, then we travel down the road, we come to Singapore, they do projects in this country, then we come back. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was my, my first country. And Malaysia was great because it's also, um, it's a Muslim country. So oh. I felt the sense of brotherhoodness there. Right. Uh, and they're very friendly. You always feel like a dear guest, you know, mm. like, um, and they also know about Uzbekistan. It's one of the few they people, do. they know Samarkand, they know Imam al-Bukhari, they know our history, sometimes right. even better than us. Oh, wow, that is... Because, because you know, impressive. they study it, yeah. Right. So, it's it's a really cool place. I, I love Malaysia. It's one of my favorite. So countries. how long did you say you lived there? Well, I went there uh, for a month as mm -hmm. an exchange student. Yep. And then I went maybe six, seven times. So in total, I probably spent there maybe uh, maybe four to three to four months of my life. I okay. Yeah. Okay. So a short amount of time, but it was enough for the country to kind of capture your yeah. heart and. Yeah. You still like going there. Okay, and then after Malaysia, where did you? And United States, United New States. York, which was a very, very different, um, you know, experience. Mm -hmm. And again, it's a great experience because it teaches you to be independent. Yeah. It teaches you to be, um, I think maybe also part of it was the business school in New York. Mm -hmm. So I really learned to be very, you know, autonomous, mm -hmm. 
plan well, deliver, work hard, all those things. Mm -hmm. So that was a, you know, that's why in New York, New York City, I love New York, you mm -hmm. know, go there quite often. After that, I went back, so I had time to reflect. Then I was in UK and I traveled around Europe quite mm -hmm. a bit. Um, UK was also a cool experience in many yeah. ways, but it's, you know, United Kingdom is an like it's an overpopulated island. I it's see. an island, island right. country, and people who live on islands they are they are usually different. In what ways? Well, I would just you know if you compare it to America, there's many people, so things are small, roads are small, houses are small, uh. Uh, cars uh, have smaller engines, mm -hmm. um, gas is more expensive, you know, utilities are more expensive. I see. Some of the things we take for granted in America are not like that in yeah. UK. And actually in UK, I wanted to fly. Mm -hmm. And I remember I called um, the airport. And just to give you an idea, in America, most of the times you land, landings are free. Okay. Uh, in a small airport. Okay. So you can land as many times as you want. That's mm -hmm. why people from all over the world come to America to practice, you know, because to practice to land plane well, you need to do a lot of landings, maybe hundreds and hundreds, maybe, you know. So in UK, they told me, they said, okay, yeah, you can, you can do that. It was um, outrageous, maybe three times more than what it cost in America. But wow. then they say hey, each landing will be 70 pounds. And pound at that time was like almost double to a dollar. So wow. it was like $120 every time each wheels, time. wheels touch down on the runway. I'm like, what? they're like, yeah, that's like, um, Welcome to UK, um, and I obviously I, at that time I couldn't do it. Right. It was just way too much. Like, and in America, in one lesson you maybe do like ten landings. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just like a lesson where you just <laughs> yeah. do landings. And imagine doing that in other countries. I also know Germany is like that. So in that sense, I felt like like for things that I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you like powerful cars, if you like boating, if you like airplanes. U.S. is probably way better than, than Europe. Yeah. You know, but if you like history, if you like, uh, you know, historical buildings, if you like to be able to jump on a train, uh, on a, you know, like a high-speed uh, train and go like to to Paris, then obviously UK is better. Mm -hmm. So Makes depends sense. depends what you like. I really enjoyed the time that I lived there, but I I realize it's not for me. Like I like right. go I like going there and visiting. I regularly go to to Europe. I go I teach in Spain. Uh, quite a bit so I like going to you know Madrid Barcelona mm -hmm. uh, but living there no no okay and how about uh, in terms of Uzbek diaspora experience since you've visited several countries uh, have you met any Uzbeks in any of these countries was there a big Uzbek diaspora Could you yeah tell us a little UK more about that? had um, has very big um, Uzbek diaspora I was there on evening, so I had my classmates, mm -hmm. and a few of them became very successful bankers there, investment bankers, nice. so there's a lot of uh, Uzbeks in finance mm -hmm. right here in London. Uh, in Malaysia too, there are Uzbeks who go to study, because Malaysia has some universities, like um, pretty good universities, mm -hmm. and um, I, you know, I met some exchange students there, even some faculty, some professors who teach in Malaysia, mm -hmm. so Malaysia also has a few nice um in us i have my friends from uzbekistan actually my best friend one of my best friends he lives in uh, in charlotte north carolina do you visit him a lot <laughs> here's a here's a true story like two weeks ago he called me he's just like ah oh, why don't you come over we have friends coming from virginia they uh -huh. drive me and i'm like uh and i didn't want to fly because of this COVID. i'm not gonna fly like airline mm -hmm. so and i had other things you know related to work I finished them about afternoon, maybe 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. And I opened my Garmin pilot program. I looked, five hour flight. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I packed my stuff, put it in the plane, flew to Maryland, landed oh, there, wow. had lunch in Maryland, refueled the plane, and then flying to Charlotte. So, um, and then I called him. I, you know, I can call from plane. Mm -hmm. So I have headset. I call him. And he's just like, where are you? And I said, I started my initial descent to Charlotte. I'll be on the ground in 22 minutes. Wow, you're talking to him from up there. Yeah, <laughs> and, and he could hear a traffic controller talking to me at that time. Uh -huh. And they're telling me, okay, I descent. So I'm starting my descent. So I'm talking to air traffic controllers. And that's, by the way, something you learn as a pilot. You can actually hear 
few different frequencies. Right. It's very hard to do when you're untrained, but once you train as a pilot, it's easy. So you okay. can be talking to a traffic controller and listening to some other, maybe um, you know, another controller, wow, okay. place where you're going. So instead of another controller, I was talking to my friend. I see. And he's just like, oh my God, like I can hear it. <laughs> and I said, yes. Uh, and he's like, I'm driving to the airport. So, you know, 20 minutes wow. later, I landed, he met me there and then. What is not fit for little? Вот еще другой самолет приземляется. Вон самолет приземляется. Джудаем вчера ли аэропорт? Я озом хвазы кюрдом ичкерлари, ваши вчера ли ики. Я калаш мукю мас, ковид дистанс. Привет, как я мыса? The next day we went flying, then our friends came. I spent few days there, and then my aunt lives in Atlanta. Now. If I were to drive to Charlotte from my house, right. it will be 14, 15 hours right. minimum. So it's mm -hmm. like the whole day. Flying was five hours and it was very easy when you fly. Actually, uh, I was just telling you, right? right? Flying is safer than driving, but it's also in some ways much easier because mm -hmm. once you in cruise, you do very little. Mm -hmm. You just monitor the systems. You make sure like, you know, your oil pressures are good, temperatures yeah. are good, but in general, planes are very stable plane just goes mm -hmm. and then once the time comes like okay we have we should start descent you just you know take the power down a little bit and you start coming down wow. so it's actually uh, i i find it to be more relaxing than driving mm -hmm. so it's safer too right it's, it's safer yeah. too yes and then my aunt lives in atlanta so i called my aunt she's like oh we're cooking plov <laughs> and i didn't have plov with my friends i'm like okay i'm gonna fly in for dinner jump in a plane again the uh, same day yeah, evening. Wow. No, I nice. spent a few days in Charlotte right. and then and then in the evening like um, maybe at six I talked to my aunt. Uh -huh. At eight I was already in Atlanta, Georgia. In two hours. Yeah. Wow. It took me an hour and a half flying time, yeah. but you know, my friend took me to the airport yeah. and then um, she has an airport like this, like four minutes from your house. Mm -hmm. So as I'm coming to landing again, I called her. She's like, where are you? I'm like, I'm maneuvering to landing right now. I'll be on the ground like in five minutes. She called me, she said, call me in five minutes. You know, the airport's so cl close. And then um, then I had dinner, spent a couple of days there. So my grandmother, my family members jump in a plane. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend in Carolina, but she has two houses. So she lives in Raleigh and another house is a few hours from Raleigh. And she's like, I don't know where I'm going to be. I said, don't worry. Just tell me where you are. I can go to Raleigh and then go home. I can go to this other city and go home. doesn't mm -hmm. matter for me. So we met up on my way back. Um, we landed. We had lunch. I jumped on a plane. Four and a half hours, I'm home. So wow. when I think about it, like, I couldn't have done it in a car. Right. Imagine like 17 hour drive there. Of course. And then from Charlotte to Atlanta, four and a half hour drive there. Mm -hmm. So wow, having it a plane. Been, yeah, it's it's um it's different. Right. And then you meet a lot of people. Like, I have so many friends who have planes now, you know, like from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. And then they organize fly-ins. Right. You know, like yesterday I went on a fly-in where like maybe ten planes from my airports. We decide, hey, why don't we go to like to the beach together? Wow. We all fly together to the beach. Or why don't we go and have breakfast in this airport? We all fly in and have breakfast there. Right. So that's something but also i think i think we're very privileged in this country yeah and i think it's very important to give back mm -hmm. so whereas in my academic job i like to give back as a pilot too i do a lot of volunteering flights right. animal rescue flights so um there's a program called pilots pilots and paws okay so we bring animals like dogs and cats that uh maybe maybe they're they're preparing to put them into sleep and then oh. somebody adopts a dog in oh. another part of the of the country imagine let's say in florida there is like a um a facility and they say okay we cannot upkeep with these dogs and this dog needs to be to put in sleep yeah. somebody in new hampshire says i'm going to adopt this dog okay they say okay if you're going to adopt it you need to take it mm -hmm. how are you going to take it so there is this program where wow. we volunteer pilots we basically it can be sometimes few planes yeah. so somebody maybe flies from carolina picks a dog in florida 
bring the dog to Pennsylvania. We fly from here to Pennsylvania, pick that wow. dog and take the dog to New Hampshire to the new owner. That is an amazing initiative. I love doing it. And wow. especially seeing when you bring, and, and dogs are amazing, they love to fly. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I had some really great dogs that would just be there and they're so comfortable Aww. in the plane and then we land and the new owner comes and right. they're like, oh so my excited. God. Yeah. yeah, so it gives a mission to our flying. Mm -hmm. So we're basically doing something um, good. Yeah. We're doing something fun. It's and amazing. then we're also flying long distances. We're getting experience. Mm -hmm. So that's something I really enjoy doing, like doing a volunteer flights. That is amazing. So are you allowed to let the dog to kind of just sit around or do you have to put them like in a cage or well, something? Well, sometimes they're in a cradle. Depends on the dog. Uh -huh. But we had some dogs that are so well behaved. And the, the crew that bringing the dog, they say this dog is amazing. And we just, we let the dog sit on the back. And the dog oh. is just sitting on the back, sometimes looking and you know just just there but they never give any problems or anything while flying one time yeah so i had this one dog and it was interesting <laughs> so that was at that time the the president was president trump he was uh -huh. visiting new york so when, whenever president visits they close the airspace it's called uh -huh. tfr or temporary flight restriction mm -hmm. so planes are not allowed to fly for safety reasons right. they do it for other reasons as well let's say if there is like a, a football game mm -hmm. over that stadium planes cannot fly. Why? Because they're flying drone there, they might be a helicopters filming, they just close the airspace. Mm -hmm. uh, so, or sometimes maybe there's a military doing exercise or they're shooting, so they close the airspace. The, clo the airspace is closed, but when you get a permission, sometimes they allow you to transition. Mm -hmm. So we went there, we picked this dog, but this dog was very nervous. Oh. The dog is in the trunk of the plane, it's an, in a cradle. As we start, as we take off, the dog barks non-stop we're coming to new york we ask for permission they say yes you're allowed to tfr to temporary flight restriction yeah. zone but you have to be really like very precise when you fly there because they're allowing you but like you are next to the president so you should not do anything crazy as we get in the dog is barking so much the air traffic controller heard from our we are sitting in front of the plane the dog is on the back but it, yeah. it's so loud and the controller says, what's going on with you guys? Like, like, what is the noise I'm hearing? So we had to tell, we said, uh, we're doing a rescue, animal rescue flight. There's an animal that's nervous. So that's the noise you're hearing. Like the uh, plane is under control. Yeah. You know, there's nothing nothing bad going on with the plane, but we just have this dog, it's it's really nervous. And then controls were fine. They, they, once you give them the reason, yeah. they know like, uh, it's fine. Like there's nothing to worry okay. about. So, But it was one, one time that was, and when we landed, the dog tried to run away and you can imagine i showed you the field right yeah if the dog runs away it's they have to shut down all the airplanes right. immediately because the engines are a big danger for a dog and yeah. the dog is a danger for airplanes because it can damage the engine right. you know so it's like and we're holding the dog and the dog is trying it was a big dog and we're like okay don't let the dog run because that will be like an emergency in the whole airport oh, because my, then the president was there too right or no that was already oh, when okay, we landed okay. in, in in um we actually we were flying to connecticut so oh, we landed okay. in, in one of the airports around here and then we we brought the dog to the new owner and then they put a leash on it and then the dog come down obviously oh. the dog was a little nervous but that was a kind of an interesting experience yeah. fun experience <laughs> But speaking of the dogs, when I was a student pilot one yeah. time, one instructor had a dog, a puppy. The puppy runs away and they can't, you know, the airport is so big. It's right. like three kilometers, one runway, two kilometers, another one. The dog is running. I'm coming to landing and they're saying, don't land, there is a dog. And I can oh, see no. this cars chasing the dog, but they can't, the dog is uh, escaping, you know. <gasps> it, was, uh, it was like a German shepherd, uh -huh. so it was very fast. Then they got the dog. They put the dog into one of the service cars. As they draw, they put the window down. The dog jumped out again. Oh, no. And they're like, okay, and they're like, all airplanes, nobody's landing. We have a dog running around. And then they, they run. They not keep him in. Yeah, so the dogs, and the dog was so happy because there's so much space. Right. And then there's cars. So the dog is really excited. It's running on the run. They're and playing with see. him. Yeah. I'm looking, I'm like, oh my God, I see like the, the dog and the people running. Yeah. So it happens, it happens. So you were, the dog was saved. Though, the dog right? was Nothing saved. Happened. We dogged the dog to the new owner. Mm -hmm. So it was one time when we had there. And then sometimes we have, we deliver cats as well. Yeah. So cats normally in cradles, you have like eight, nine cradles, maybe 10 cats. 
cats are also very, you know, they're fine with white. Yeah, a lot of them are very fine. Yeah, they yeah. never even like make noises. So. Nice. So since you've traveled to so many different countries, um, could you talk about some of the maybe challenges you faced as someone, as an immigrant, maybe in the United States when you first came? Well, um, any immigrant, not just me, and it doesn't matter, like, you know, we came from Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. but if somebody's coming from India or China, we all face um, challenges. Right. And, and in fact, in the international business, we call it liability of foreigners. What liability of foreigners means is that just because you're a foreigner, things are a little bit more difficult for you. Right. Like transaction cost of any transaction goes up That's why true. you talk with an accent people maybe don't trust you right away you know mm -hmm. which is normal they like they question you so it's harder for you to let's say to get a loan mm -hmm. go to the bank bankers like oh you don't have a credit history you know so these things and for any foreigner and any immigrant you go you have to go through that so you have to be more resilient to get through that transaction cost you yeah. have to be basically prepared that some people might not be so open you have to be and you have to understand why because yeah. you know you are different you know we are different so I think um, that that was some of the things yeah and then um, but you know in Uzbekistan um, what I found is that if you're hardworking yeah. and you're honest eventually you get through anything so that's a I would say two main qualities that you need to do mm -hmm. you have to be hardworking because America is a country where you guys know you have to deliver your work right nothing else matters really you know but if you're professional in what you're doing you're doing really well you're prepared that's what's gonna count mm -hmm. and people will forgive you your accent you they will forgive some other yeah. things you know that you yeah. may be looking different or you may yeah. be you know so that that's how you should approach it always that was at least for me i always try to be really good at what i'm doing uh, because if you don't do your job well then you're in trouble right. but if you do your job really well then there is no problem and a lot of research about immigrants uh, suggests that, you know, immigrants are different from regular people. Mm -hmm. uh, one quality that all immigrants have, they have higher risk tolerance level. By going to another country, you're taking a lot of risk. So people who go outside, whether we, whether like we come from Uzbekistan, somebody coming from Brazil, somebody coming from China, somebody coming from Russia, in some ways we're similar to them. Yeah. Because we took a chance to go to another land and start a new life. Right we are risk takers from among other Uzbeks if we were to compare our risk risk tolerance level would, would be would be much higher yes. we are more comfortable with risk because it's a very risky risk decision somebody who is afraid of risk will not will never do that mm -hmm. for them it will be just imagine you're coming to a new place where you don't have friends people speak a different language everything is different there and like let's take country like UK people even drive on the, on, the, on the other side right. you know like things friends, like that you yeah. need to get used to so people who do it, they already high tolerance to risk, and usually they are more hardworking people. Right. But also, when you come as an immigrant to a society, you normally feel insecure because you don't have that, you know, like a safety net of your relatives around yeah. you. You know, a lot of the times you don't. Right. And what what it does to you, interestingly, it actually makes you work even harder because there are studies about like you know there are a lot of nations where people um there's a lot of immigrants mm -hmm. you know from israel from korea right. you know people travel they from from you know ancient times and they found that immigrants normally because of that insecurity they work harder and that's why they get more successful often they become much more successful than locals again if you look at that's ceos true. of top american companies I forgot the percentage, but for like more than half of them, English is not their first language. Yeah. They came from other countries. Yeah. Google CEO from India, you know, like all these guys, they come from other countries. Ima imagine somebody coming from India, you speak with an Indian accent. Yeah. And it's, it's not the coolest accent. Yeah. It's, it's not a French accent, it's not a British accent, right? <laughs> right? It's an Indian accent. And yet you get through that system against that resistance. Right. Okay, so, so you know immigrants in that sense are more hard work in, in terms of like diaspora i had some friends i have few friends you mm -hmm. know um but like i never again i never looked at it like i need to have uzbek friends to succeed yeah, yeah. like i usually looked like who is the best in this job and you know and like for this particular project mm -hmm. and i would align but i obviously have friends with whom i've been friends since, since school and like I told you, like, you know, 
one of my best friends he lives in charlotte right so he was also in umidi he studied in london you know i was studying in new york so i actually at that time went to visit him in in, in europe you know and i went to paris all that stuff so we have all these memories we're, we're good friends mm -hmm. he's here so i i connect and we have uh, friends yep. yes but other than that i think i think diaspora is great but you should also to be really fully merged and take opportunities of this country you should step out of it right it's you true. know because if you just stick with your locals and i met people like that if you go to like in new york you guys know like uh, go to um what they call it like um where all the russians live brighton oh, beach yes. you go to brighton beach there are people who lived in this country for 20 years they don't speak english you yeah, know no. and then you ask them like they don't even like and then but there's many immigrants who traveled across america yeah. and visited all places in america you know so i think it's great to have a diaspora and i have it and all of you should have it yeah. but also don't think that that's going to be panacea to all your problems yeah. no step aside have an american friend have a french friend have a brazilian friend you will actually be surprised you can connect with people from yeah. other places i have really good friends from latin america yeah I have good friends from Asia. I have good friends from Russia. I have good friends from yeah. America who are locals. Yeah. And actually, when I was in New York, one of my best friends was American. And one time he said, he told me, he said, dude, it's crazy. You grew up in, in communist country. Like, I always thought, like, Soviet Union is our enemy. But we were so similar. He said, but we are, we are so similar. Yeah. Like, we had, like, a lot of, like, we loved the same type of cars. We had similar hobbies. And yet we were coming from different parts of the world. We bonded, we became best friends. We still keep in touch, wow. you know? He grew up in New York, I grew up in Tashkent. What yeah. are the chances? So I think that's how you should look at the world. You know, don't be like, oh no, I'm Uzbek. I'm only gonna be talking right. to Uzbek. No, right. talk to other, other nations, be open-minded. Yeah. Yeah. You're actually gonna learn more from that, from, from those interactions yeah. and it's gonna enrich your life. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. It's funny because when you were talking about your immigrant experience, I could see a lot of it that I went through as well. Definitely, you know, with the accent, it was very challenging yeah. in the beginning. Even for me, you know, obviously, like, I came not speaking English, you know. It was definitely challenging. And as you said, you know, my parents actually decided to move to Connecticut. Why? Because they were scared that if I live in New York, I'm going to kind of stick with Russian, Uzbek friends, and not learn the language, which... I'm really grateful they did that because you know I was put in situations where I'm just forced to speak English so that's why I ended up learning it pretty fast and you know I was kind of like trying to um, have different types of friends not just stick to like maybe Uzbeks or just mm -hmm. Americans but you know I have like an Arab friend I have a Spanish friend I have a Brazilian actually yeah. actually and it's true it really helps you grow you know kind of expands your mindset so I absolutely agree with you in terms of that and now you know talking about different qualities um, is there any qualities that you kind of still keep um, that you know, you know, like a Uzbek quality, maybe you know that like a culture, some kind of cultural quality that you still kept even though you moved to a different country where everything is different? Would you say there's anything like that? Uh, Uzbek quality, I don't know. Is hard working our quality? Yes, very. So probably yeah. that was something that I, and maybe being respectful because yes. I was uh, commented a lot of the times. Even when I was in New York, when I first came to America, yeah. that I was very respectful. And even yeah. my American friends said, you guys are so respectful, yeah. it's amazing. So I think that's something I learned in our culture. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a really great quality because it helps you in all your business transactions. That's true. To be always respectful to other people, like our country, you know, yeah. we know how to do it. Uh, and it's, I think it's better to, be, to give more respect than less. True. Because if you give less, you can you can actually uh, you can uh, mess up the relationship yeah. or transaction. But if you give more, it's you just you be respectful, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I would say those are the two main qualities, probably. Yeah, to tag along with that, you know, uh, I've actually also had a similar experience where people kind of notice, you know, it's just like, wow, you know, like some things that are so s normal, for example, for other c people in other countries to do, we kind of think twice before we do them, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, for example, like I think we're in Uzbekistan very like 
in terms of hospitality were very good and that's something that my friends have told me you know they come in and I'm like oh sit down and you start making them tea and they're like what are you doing you're like why are you doing that and then then it just hit me because to us it's so normal in Uzbekistan and then I just explained oh whenever a guest comes you know you kind of sit them down you put you know like tea you bring tea you bring bread and all these things and me and Hassan didn't get amazing. any tea from you I don't know right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see any of this I need some paperwork on that claim it's coming it's still coming <laughs> We're your guests at the airport. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're actually in the airport. I'm kidding. Yeah, we're Yes, so I'm the guest yeah. here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those qualities, definitely. Um, it's great to keep those good qualities, but also to adjust depending on the country you're living yeah. in. So is there any advice you have for people that are planning to move to a different country to maybe get a head start, to prepare in some way, or any tips for when after they come, so they adjust faster to the environment? So biggest tip now, uh, probably yes. study English because like it's going to be very hard to succeed if you don't speak the language yeah. so wherever you are located spend as much time as possible studying English you can do it in the country but it's going to be more expensive yeah it will be way more expensive so things like that so get those skills also other transferable skills like driving a car if you can get your license and loan in Uzbekistan do it it will be easier for you to america in america you'll have to take a driving test mm -hmm. but taking driving test is different from learning to drive because if you were to learn to drive in america it's again gonna cost you more money um, because i had to do it in america and i remember i was like a, a student and to me it was um it was more difficult i had mm -hmm. to find friends you know ask them and then all these other things so probably english is number one english 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 next thing is find some friends in that location and start to get to know the place yeah. even before you go there you know so you kind of assimilate That's smart. look at like google maps like if you're going to some place look at the streets what they look yeah. like so like mentally imagine that place already even before you before you go there it helps a lot uh, actually as a pilot we do it all the time you know when you fly someplace yeah. i'm landing in a city where i never been to i look at google maps yeah. I look how it's gonna look like. I imagine like, okay, so the, the, the mountain is gonna be to my left as I'm coming to landing. I will see the city lights to my right. I do it all in my head before I even go there. Wow. That helps me. Then I don't have stress, everything matches. I'm like, yeah, right. that's exactly how I plan. And yeah. if it's not like that, then mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm alerted. Something, right. I'm like, something is not going right. So, and do the same with the city too. You know, when you go into any city, any place, look up on the map where it is. Look up how it's gonna look like. Imagine how then maybe even like cars are gonna be there, like right. things like that. That way, it's not gonna be so shocking. Right. So when you come, you already kind of you already in your mind been there, and you'll be much easier. You'll be like, oh yeah, I, I kind of imagined, yeah, like Manhattan is gonna be like that. I remember I looked yeah. at it, I saw many cars, and it's very noisy. And yes, I'm that's what I expected. Right. Whereas if you brought somebody who never had any idea, yeah they will be paralyzed That's true. they will be like oh my god like what do i do now right. yeah, so things like that just like always do your homework we say do your homework mm -hmm. but do your homework really means go in your mind mentally to things right and like have a plan but also be flexible with your plan let's say you're coming i know a lot of our countrymen like they drive trucks for example right yeah they have to adopt which is you know it's great so you you're doing that but then like you look at other opportunities too I have friends who started and they had many different careers. Mm -hmm. You know, they did Uber, they draw, drove limo, then they drove trucks. Yep. Now they have their own companies and they're big companies, you know, they're very successful. But these were necessary steps because they grew through each experience they grew. Mm -hmm. So never think that, oh, I'm not going to do that job. We all have done jobs like that. You know, I, I wasn't a professor all my life. I've yep. done all different types of jobs, you know. So be prepared do whatever you need to do basically but also be flexible be adaptable and flexible and you will notice that americans are amazing people they're very open to immigrants in that sense i would say it's much more comfortable to be in the states than in like in europe all right so this interview is a bit different because we're actually going to have a blitz which means there's going to be a series of random questions we're going to ask um is a big cat and see what his answers are so let's get started so, do you prefer texting or talking on the phone? Talking. Okay. A favorite day of the week? Friday. Favorite city in the United States besides the one you live in? 
New York City. And do you have a nickname? L. Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to talk to animals? Every language in the world. Favorite holiday? Uh, <laughs> New Year's. How long does it take you to get ready? Uh, very quick. Uh, 45 seconds to dress up, 10 minutes to, <laughs> 10 minutes to take off. <laughs> <laughs> Scale of 1 to 10, how good? <laughs> okay. Scale of 1 to 10, how good of a driver are you? I am very good. How good of a pilot are you? Well, 1 to 10. I, I, I hope I'm at least 9. <laughs> at what age do you want to retire? I don't want to retire. You want to work forever? Yeah. Well, I love my job and it's not such a, like, physically challenging right, job. Right. So, so you like it. Yeah. Invisibility or super strength? Invisibility or super strength? Uh, invisibility. Right, well, that was all for our series of oh, quick that's questions. Oh, hard questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rustam Megum did a good job. I'll give him that. But today's interview, I think, was very unique in the, in the sense that it wasn't just about career. It wasn't just about school. It was just everything at once. And as you can see, Dr. Rustam Megum has a very rich experience, so we don't lie about that. It was, you know a lot to learn even for me so i hope you were able to learn a little bit from it as well and you know it helped you not only learn but it was also interesting so we're gonna you know wrap it up but we were very happy that you joined us today it was thank an you. amazing interview so thank you so much for accepting thank you very much invite. guys yes yeah. thank you well, so again fun. this was uzbek diaspora and we're happy to join us Hi everyone! Good quality, that's so bad quality. Pass right, pass right. No, I can't take pass right. I'm not going to take it right. Okay. Nice. But how long has it been just so we get a chance there? Has it been. Oh, it's already been 15 minutes? Okay, so. Okay. We can also keep the place. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's some here, like, what are the challenges you face as an immigrant? Like, how important are your tips? So I think it's been like about an hour, right? Mm -hmm. So like in terms of interview, like we touched on everything that important that I really want to touch. Yeah, that was really unique. Because if you have done it, you would have found this Robinson Aviation. <laughs> 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 Easy. <laughs> I know. There's a lot of doors. But as far as I know, all my friends and in business school village, you go to that place before because if, when you come there the next day, you're going to feel this. Yeah. Well, I'm a professor, you know? That's, I'm a professor, you know? That's, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> well, we met if the I'm professor. Getting to what, what is this, Hassan? Is Hassan wrote these questions? Yeah. Is it wrong for a vegetarian to eat animal crackers? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> He's trying to get us nervous here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hello, Hassan. Hello. 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 Hello